in this symposium, what we're doing is building on the work of the two academies, the work that's already been done focused on improving population health in an equitable way. And today's focus, as you've already uh, heard, is on changing behaviour to achieve this, to build on that. And I think there are two things that we want to get out at a higher level. One is to consider what the gaps are in the evidence for changing behaviour to improve health across populations, and what are the opportunities for accelerating the adoption of um, evidence-based uh, strategies and policies. I'm going to start by providing a behavioural science perspective uh, of shifting behaviour across populations. I want to talk first about the four behaviours that are most important for improving population health, to then come on to say a little bit about strategies for changing behaviour, ending with a few observations on generating and implementing evidence. So, four behaviours uh, which contribute most to premature uh, preventable uh, early deaths worldwide, and they are smoking, excessive consumption of food, alcohol, and sedentary behaviour, which you're engaged in at the moment. And the importance of these behaviours, I'm just going to illustrate with this table from the Global Burden of Diseases study in England, it is shown by uh, its appearance in the green bars for uh, the top 10 attributable fractions to years of life lost. And I'm assuming you can read those. Um, you can also see that there are four uh, in pink, uh, which are the metabolic risk factors, which are also partly shaped by the behaviour. So shifting those four behaviours would make a huge difference. Particularly shifting them uh, across populations would make a huge difference to the gap in life expectancy and years lived in good health um, between the rich and the poor. And that's illustrated by this very uh, good study by Chetty uh, et al. using US data, which looks at the correlations between um, risk, uh, a variety of risk factors and uh, death in the lowest quartile income, those, those in the lowest uh, income uh, quartile in the US. And you'll see that um, up here um, we have um, current smoking and obesity being highly correlated with uh, death in the cohort and uh, exercise being protective. Immediately below, and this is not a political statement, you'll see that access to healthcare is making much less uh, of a contribution. That's not a reason not to give people access to healthcare, but just showing the importance of these behaviours. And right at the bottom, uh, other factors, including local area factors, um, geography and the built environment, playing another significant role in that. Changing behaviour is difficult. There is no one way, but there are broadly less and more promising approaches. So starting with targeting conscious processes, and I'm talking about uh, in particular changing the four sets of behaviours, uh, which are the ones that we're wanting to go for. Popular approaches involve providing people with information about the risks of engaging in their behaviours. Um, these can increase awareness of the harmful nature of these behaviours, but rarely on their own are they enough to shift behaviour at the scale and with the population reach that's needed. This led people to think, well, what about if we personalise the risk information? Would that motivate people to change their behaviour? Many ways of personalising risk information using a range of biomarkers. I'm just going to illustrate this with one biomarker. Um, other testing kits are available, but this is just one, 23andMe, in exchange for a saliva sample and $100 or £100. You can learn about your risk of developing some of the uh, non-communicable chronic diseases, such as type 2 diabetes. Learn what your risk is, and uh, spoiler alert, what you can do if your risk is higher 
uh, move a little bit more, eat a little bit less, but um, why not learn about that more precisely? Um, the question then is, does this kind of information actually change our behaviour, as is suggested by those selling these kits? Cutting to the chase, um, from 18 studies, randomised control trials, looking at those four sets of behaviours of interest plus a few others, what we found is that flatline, no impact on people's behaviour. You may well think, well, that's because uh, people are feeling uh, uh, out of control because it's been a, a genetic marker. Uh, what we know from four reviews that have looked at other biomarkers for other conditions, it's a similar story, little or no behaviour change. So what's going on here? The answer, I think, is uh, pretty much shown here. Of course, we are exquisitely sensitive to risk information. But the kind of information that we're exquisitely sensitive to, shown on the right-hand side, is information about risks that are immediate, they're certain, and broadly incompatible with living to the end of the day. <laughs> Whereas on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, the kinds of risk information that we're attempting to communicate to shift the behaviours of interest to us, where it's less certain, uh, it's far more in the future, and people are being asked to trade off immediate pleasure for uh, those uncertain possible gains. So the threat isn't large enough. Now, some people will increase their motivation to change behaviour, but even when they do, it's the environment. So our environments have a far stronger impact on our behaviour than we like to imagine, and that actually is the case. So we can show this in a very simplified form uh, with dual process models of behaviour, which have been popularised by two recent uh, Nobel laureates. Uh, the central conceit, uh, so the neuroscientists can sort of close your ears at this point, this is an explanation for lay audience, um, that... Uh, our behaviour is regulated by two sets of overlapping processes, a more conscious process, uh, set of processes, which hopefully you're uh, activating at the moment to listen to what I'm saying, uh, based on thinking, a goal directed. But importantly, however smart you are, that has a limited capacity, so regulating a relatively small amount of our behaviour, with the majority of our behaviour at any one time being uh, regulated through non-conscious processes which are fast, based on feelings, habits and routine behaviour. So this helps us understand why risk information, first of all it's targeting a system which has very limited capacity and one that doesn't over, that is not regulating um, the behaviours of interest which uh, are much more uh, activated by the cues in our environments, often without our awareness. So the key question then is, well, can we identify those cues that make it more likely we engage in less healthy behaviour and more likely that we engage in healthier behaviour to remove one lot and add another lot? You'll hear more about this during the day. We can think about ourselves as existing in multiple overlapping environments at any one time. So at the moment, you're in a physical environment which has cued you to, or most of you, to sit down. Uh, some of you will be engaged with the digital world on your smartphones and the fact that you're sitting with others means that there's a social environment which is also shaping your behaviour. I'm just going to end by saying a little bit about uh, some of the cues in our immediate physical environments which is the focus of research in my group to illustrate um, some of the evidence that is generated and how that's being implemented. So in work led by Gareth Hollands in my group, and Gareth is here today, um, we've developed a typology of interventions that involve uh, changing cues in environments in order to change behaviour. And these uh, broadly look at uh, properties of objects and their placement in the environment. And this particular typology is focused on consumption of food, alcohol, and tobacco. 
We've published three, well, we've published two uh, Cochrane reviews, one on size, one on uh, labelling in the context of food, and we have a third one due out quite soon, looking at placement. I'm just going to say a little bit about the review and the work on size to illustrate my final point uh, on what it is uh, we need to do uh, for generating and implementing evidence. Now, this is relevant to uh, the behavioral science perspective that I'm presenting, and some of this will change with the different uh, levels and systems that are being used to generate uh, and implement evidence. So, as I mentioned, there's a Cochrane review uh, that, that uh, was, was published in 2015, which uh, uh, found 72 experimental studies that have varied some aspect of size in relation to what we were looking for, food, alcohol, and tobacco. Uh, of the 72 we found, 69 varied some component of food portion, package, or tableware. So the evidence uh, that we're able to talk about relates to food, and what we estimated from the effect size, uh, a very robust effect, the portion effect, portion size effect, um, and the estimate is that uh, if one reduced portions, package, and tableware on every single encounter with food, one could reduce the amount of energy a UK adult consumed by between 12 and 16% a day. Big effect. Two-thirds of the studies conducted in laboratories, so we've therefore moved on to field studies to see the extent to which these kinds of cues actually occur in the real world, where there's many other cues. In the final session today, uh, we'll hear something about emerging technologies for evidence synthesis uh, because this work that I'm describing here has taken uh, three years to get this far. So looking towards emerging uh, uh, technologies, is there a way of us uh, truncating the amount of time it's taking to know what the evidence is out there? In terms of mechanism, understanding the mechanism, in particular the brain systems that are involved in responding to these cues in the environment is key to optimizing interventions. So some of the brain systems, uh, the reward system is involved in uh, understanding how people respond to different sizes of appealing and less appealing food. And also the self-control systems which are affected by poverty um, are also key in how people are responding to those cues. So in the session that uh, follows uh, immediately after I finish talking, some of these systems will be explored. And finally on implementation, the extent to which we find uh, any evidence of cues uh, that look like they are going to have uh, important effects uh, in changing those uh, four sets of behaviours that I've been talking about. How do we implement? Well, over the last few years in uh, England, we've had a voluntary approach involving engagement with industry, uh, with the evidence, and uh, to date, uh, there's a lack of impact from those voluntary approaches with industry um, redesigning their, their products. Uh, that's not to say this isn't a route to follow, but uh, thus far, in the way that it's been done, this has not led to the changes expected. Um, regulation uh, is sometimes relevant. So again, I'm just talking about size-related uh, interventions. There was one attempt by uh, Michael Bloomberg in New York uh, in 2012 to attempt to cap the size at which sugary drinks were sold in certain outlets in New York. Uh, two years in the courts, but um, eventually that was overturned. Now, I'm hoping in session two that uh, part of uh, what we discussed there will lead on to different ways of implementing some of the evidence that will be uh, presented. My final slide, uh, as you uh, look forward to what I think is really just a feast of science over the next six uh, or seven hours, is to just keep three things in mind. Um, the first, uh, from the eminent statistician who died a couple of years ago, George Box, essentially all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. So you'll hear multiple models today, and that's 
just fine. Uh, my second quote uh, comes from someone uh, very much alive. He's going to be taking us through the final session, Harry Rutter, and this is a, a sort of a, a twist on a, a key, a key uh, idea uh, that um, the single most important intervention is for people to understand that there is no single most important intervention. So that is, again, very important to remember. And then finally, uh, bringing us back to uh, this uh, symposium, uh, this is an opportunity, opportunity for uh, the researchers, uh, those uh, involved in funding research, as well as the policy makers, to think about new collaborations that go across the sciences and other disciplines across methods and across geographies, both in terms of research teams, but also in terms of who we're researching in order to meet this significant challenge of changing behavior to improve health for all. Thank you very much.